morning, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Military History Q&A, the only YouTube channel that will not rewrite history unless bribed with a whole lot of Danish pastries for doing so. Now, a little editorial before we start. Um, you can find all the photos I use in these episodes on our website, lostbattlefields.com. That's where I upload them all as, uh, as we go. And also, there's a, a new contact email, so you can write me directly with all your different questions. And militaryhistoryqa at mail.com. It'll be here below. So, that's it. Also, I am getting ready for my trip up to Poland, uh, Germany, Czechoslovakia. I'm shooting a bunch of documentaries for you. And Discovery Channel has expressed some interest in uh, me shooting something for them. But you know you're going to get all the cool sites to see here first. And if you have any ideas, suggestions for me to go take a look at cool World War II locations uh, in Poland, this would be a good time. I still have a few uh, weeks left and I'm still planning my trips and hotels and all that stuff. So I hope to see all of you in Poland and anybody want to show me something really cool out there? Give me a call. I'm also going to try to make it up to Norway because so many of you have sent me videos and photos of these amazing installations, locations, fortifications up there that I just have to see and shoot out in detail and bring you. Um, thank you so much for all your kind words and notes on, on the movies and on uh, some of the videos I shot out in Denmark with my little GoPro back then. I promise you I have a, uh, a better camera now and I'll try to stay away from the front of it per some of you. Um, all right, funny quote of the week from the Russian field manual in 1930. It clearly states, and it's prudent advice you can take to the bank today, do not touch anything unnecessary. Beware of pretty girls in bars. They may be spies. Beware of bicycles, revolvers, uniforms, arms, dead horses, or dead men lying on the road. They did not get there by accident. Prudent advice for America today. <laughs> Beware of pretty girls in dance halls and parks. They may be spies. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, don't say the Russians are smart. They're onto something. On this day in history, uh, I picked a couple of interesting ones. Uh, 1865, eight men were convicted of the murder of Abraham Lincoln. In 1909, the U.S. Army took possession of their very first aircraft. And in 1967, Major Robert H. Lawrence Jr. became the first black astronaut. All go. And on to the next. I, I usually finish off with the uh, picture of the week. But I'm going to start with Picture of the Week. And not only that, I feel charitable, so I'm going to give you two because some of them are kind of cool. Object 279, a Russian tank from 1959. And yes, they actually built this thing. And yes, it looks absolutely cool. I don't play uh, World of Tanks, but Chieftain, dude, if you don't have this, you got to put this in, in the game. You, you really do. Because it exists. Object 279. It done like a uh, UFO. It looks like a saucer with enormous gun. It had a thousand horsepower engine and it weighed 60 tons. It had four tracks. I mean, come on, this is just cool. Uh, I guess they built it to be nuclear proof and to navigate soft terrain. Still, it's kind of cool. Um, it had between 319 and 269 uh, millimeters of armor. It's still in the museum. It's kind of cool. And since we are on the Russians of cool, strange, odd, interesting, weird tanks, that probably did not go very far because, well, Object 279 would probably bankrupt the steel industry if they build enough of them. Um, World War II, before World War II, they built a variant of the T-26 called the TR-26C. And it looks like this, and I think it's kind of cool. I had to do a little double take, say, what is that exactly? That is a fuel tank. So this is a fuel delivery vehicle. Uh, I guess they built it in order to uh, transport fuel over difficult terrain to other tanks. But I don't know. It may just be me. Uh, looking at a poorly armored tank and put a ginormous 
fuel tank on top of it and then rolling anywhere within eyesight of any German units. Dudes with rifles, Air Force, cannons, what came before the Pac-36? Put a German bullseye on it. I mean, I would not want to be the one riding this thing. I'm not sure how many they built because I can't find out. If any of you know, let me know. And I am not entirely sure how many of them survived the war, but I have a guess. And I've never, never, never seen a tanker come out uh, writing the book about how he survived the war driving one of these things. Anyway, pictures of the week, here you go. And I know some of you have asked what's going on with the uh, long-winded video about the difference between the German and French doctrine. Still working on it, but I want to do it right, so I'm going to take a little time, plus the all the stuff that's going on. I've been a little busy. But let's get back to uh, three questions of the week that you have asked, and now I can dig into my pile and give you hopefully three good answers. Let's get started. All right, so question number one is David is asking, during the Second World War, did Germany attempt to aid Italy's military production, or at least advance it to a closer stage of development in comparison with Germany, uh, at least get them out of the late 20s? I don't think that question is entirely fair to the Italians, because the Italians, they were advanced, they had uh, good mechanical uh, skills, they knew what they were building, uh, in 1939, the Italians had more submarines than the Germans did. They had uh, about a hundred. Uh, of course, during the war, the Germans built more than the Italians. They'd only built some 20-plus submarines during the war. Italy's problem was not technically advancement. It was a lack of uh, re resources, of iron, metals, of, uh, production facilities. And you cannot really argue the Germans were very advanced when it came to technology, and to building, construction, but not to the degree that the Germans would have needed if the Germans had put their economy on a wartime footing in 1938, 39 even. Uh, they would have had a vastly higher output of uh, war materials and tanks and planes, and uh, that would have aided them quite a bit in the long run. But we're back to the Italians. The Germans also, again, with all this production, they weren't really able to give the Italians a whole lot. Because, remember, World War II, to a large degree, uh, was a war of natural resources, of materials. Uh, when the Germans started building the, uh, the, the Western Wall, the Atlantic Wall, they literally stopped all production and construction in France because they needed all that material. So start building uh, more war material and giving it to the Italians would have been a stretch. And we got to see in the light that the Tripact Agreement was only signed in 1939. And I will say there's quite a few flaws and issues with the uh, Tripact between Japan, Italy, and Germany in the sense that you had three allies that really did not trust each other to a, a hundred percent degree. They certainly did not coordinate their intentions and Mussolini was jumping off attacking things in Abyssinia and Africa and Greece that somewhat derailed some of the, or at least sidetracked, a lot of the German military in order to sort of bail him out. And again, Mussolini had insisted on Italians carrying Italian equipment, Italian weaponry, and so on and so forth. What the Tripact should have done is have, uh, they barely had time. By the time they signed their agreement, the war was not that far off. Uh, but they should have streamlined their production and their weaponry uh, so they all produced the same ammunition, weapons, uh, down to infantry, uh, up to rifles and, and perhaps aircrafts and tanks. But that was just simply not feasible. Also because the different theaters, and I'm going to involve the Japanese as well, the different theaters had completely different needs. It was different battlefields and it was not practical to do so. Besides, if you take the German 88, which is one of the best cannons coming out of World War II, the Italians had a great 90mm already. Uh, the Italians had some great aircraft. Uh, 
they had good planes, they had good material, they did not have enough of it, and you would also make the note that the Italian overriding problem was Mussolini's impulsiveness of charging into wars that he couldn't really win or hadn't really thought through, and then you break it down into the problem with the chain of command, say in Africa, between the Italians and the Germans, where the Italians were put in a royal command, pretty much just to spite Rommel, and he didn't care. And there's a lot of reasons why things did not go as smoothly as they could have. But certainly, Italian development uh, and technology was there. And there was an exchange of information between the Italians and the Germans, and both and technology information and plans, and all the way up to uh, the nuclear field where Italian scientists had, uh, nuclear scientists had provided Germans with uh, extremely valuable information and technological breakthroughs. So there was that exchange. If we take, for instance, the, the Fiat G55 Centaur uh, and the 90 millimeter cannon, they were, they were great weapons. Certainly there was great Italian equipment, weaponry, technological. They were there. They had some great battleships. And then they had issues with getting the shells to have the right size. There was probably not the same technology discipline as the Germans had. But the German production also had its issues uh, with uh, all the different uh, competing, putting out to bid of the different companies. Uh, fighting for contracts and then being issued the same contracts and several different offices being issued the same orders and parameters. There were certainly also issues there, but within Italy there were also uh, production issues and again a lack of raw materials that the Germans also had a lack of, which is why they uh, kept expanding and, and invading other countries to get some of the materials they needed to even win the war. So for them to start actively supplying the Italians would have been a stretch. Like I said, initially, if the Tripact had made a streamlined uh, plan of production of uh, matching arms, weaponry, planes, tanks, so on and so forth, that would have been much easier for them to do mutual support and production and logistics would have been easier, uh, but that was not in the cards. But certainly, Italy, uh, they did not need uh, technical advice in that sense. They were already there and they were good on, well on their way. Not to say that the Germans actually did give the Italians some weaponry, especially captured weaponry. And you'll see uh, French uh, Sharpie tanks rolling around in, in the desert and in Italy. There's a lot of captured equipment that the Germans passed on to their allies. So in that sense, there were some uh, direct uh, military aid in that sense. But when it comes to technology, the Italians were not a backwoods nation. Uh, they just did not have the uh, materials or the logistical setup or the factories to build at the speed with which they needed uh, what they needed to wage the war Mussolini decided they were going to wage. And the Germans really was not in a position to outfit the entire Italian army, uh, nor were plans made for this. This was a political um, agreement, the Tri-Pact, not as much a military cooperation pact where the military sat down and hammered out what they needed and then put that up to the factories, uh, what to supply them with. It, it was too little, too late in that sense, and probably hampered all of them more than it benefited any of them. But that's a different question that we may get to if somebody asks it. All right, the next question is one of those that probably should have been elaborated a little bit on there. Um, it is, if the United States had not intervened in World War I, who would have won? Now, you have to really define intervention because the United States was involved in World War I pretty much from the day it started. Uh, U.S. banks were holding uh, bonds for every allied country. They were lending all uh, the Entente powers money and building war materials for them. 
So you can certainly say that was involvement other than being actively involved boots on the ground. So you have an economic involvement, you have production involvement, you have a military involvement. Which ones of them do you mean? Uh, because there's a lot of different ramifications to each one of them and potentially uh, worldwide ramifications if the United States had literally done nothing and sat on the fence at all. Um, so you can say financially, but if you go with the, let's go with if they had not intervened, I really want to say interfered, it was a European battle and the United States took sides. And all right, let's say the United States had done absolutely nothing and remained absolutely neutral throughout World War I and not delivered weaponry to any side or delivered weaponry to both sides. Uh, had not uh, participated in the embar in embargo of Germany or embargoed everybody, uh, or not. If the United States had stayed out completely in every way, I think the war would still have been uh, won by the Entente powers, by France and by uh, England. I remember, there's pretty much every country in Europe and some far-flung countries were involved in World War I, so it wasn't that simple. But if it was possible for the British and the French to embargo uh, Germany and keep Russia in the war, now remember the United States played some hand in getting Trotsky to the Soviet Union, which caused the uh, Russian uh, revolution and pulled Russia out of the war at a weak enough point that Germany advanced far to the east in 1917 and held a lot of ground uh, in the East that they might have held on to. So if you uh, remember Trotsky, he lived in New York, and he was actually he was sent off with some money uh, to uh, the Russian Revolution to get that started, um, and he was stopped in Canada, because Canada was also fighting World War I, and they did not want to let him go, except for the uh, Americans said they should. Um, so all that cost the Russian Revolution, or at least sparked it, fueled it, sped it up. Um, there's some economic involvement with the Russians as well on behalf of the United States that also would have been uh, not happened. So there's the whole Eastern Front part. I still think uh, that the war would have ended uh, with a somewhat of a defeat towards Germany. But remember, Germany was never invaded from the West. The British and the French never really made, never made it into German territory. So Germany was not defeated as such. They were embargoed, people were starving, their allies were being defeated around them and one by one fell away. Uh, the German people were starving and they were tired. But the French and the British were also tired of war and had lost millions of people just like the Germans. Um, they were also living under hardship, although not as much because Germany did not have the ability to embargo either. So if there had been a free trade, Britain and France would still be supplied while to some degree able to starve off Germany, especially if Russia had stayed in the war, if the Russian Revolution had been defeated or at least pushed until after a decisive outcome of the war would have happened. That means the Germans could have been in a position to negotiate peace, uh, especially after, after Ludendorff's last offensive, while it was still uh, going well, that would have been an optimal time to negotiate. Germans held a lot of uh, room all the way into uh, what is today Russia, all the way up to the Baltics, and they were making inroads in an offensive in the West. That would have been a good time to start negotiations before that faltered and the Allied finally pushed them back and made it all the way uh, up to the, um, up to towards the German border. Because again, uh, the German soldiers were unsupplied and they were tired and everybody was tired and you had revolution in the trenches on pretty much all sides in, in all countries. So there's a lot of different things that would have happened differently if the United States had stayed out completely. 
then you can say if the United States has stayed out partially by not having putting boots on the ground, uh, but only have sent money and supplied and embargoed Germany, that's pretty much an intervention right there, because the most important aspect of uh, the United States support for the uh, Allies during World War I was uh, the money and the supplies and the uh, aid to the embargo of Germany, far more so than the U.S. soldiers on the ground. The, remember, the U.S. expeditionary force under uh, John Pershing, Black Jack Pershing, was he wanted to keep his men together regardless. The only time they were, that, that rule was broken was after Ludendorff's big offensive started to pay, uh, pay off. They simply had to use American troops to, to help the French and British pluck some of the holes and the gaps. Uh, other than that, the big American offensive was scheduled for 1919, after the war officially ended. So, and I'm certainly not taking anything away from the U.S. troops that did fight uh, in World War I, because they did. They fought at uh, the, the Bailey Woods, the Chanteau Terry, uh, the Mosagon. They, they made it all the way to the Hindenburg Line, in, in some cases. So, those who were there, uh, they fought, they, they fought well, but it took a long time for the United States Army to get ready for that fight. Because as World War I started, I think, the, the, I believe the U.S. military was the 21st uh, uh, largest uh, in, in the world. They had a very small and unprepared military. So it took time to get everything going and production and so on and so forth. And a lot of the production went to the British and French. So again, we're back to how much uh, intervention are we talking about in the question. Um, again, the Germans would have lost eventually. It might have taken longer. I mean, almost certainly the Germans would have lost the war but we're still looking at how it could have come to a negotiated peace. And another thing, if the United States has stayed out completely, well, then uh, President Wilson would not have been able to talk about his 14 points. There would be no League of Nations. There would be no precursor to the UN. Uh, if there had been a negotiated peace settlement where everybody had gone back to 1914 borders and said well we're just gonna not fight anymore or everybody's tired we're gonna negotiate a peace the US wouldn't have been at that table there would have been no uh, UN at that point and again we're back to does that does the US aid uh, and support even tacitly uh, US bankers support for the Russian Revolution would that have caused the Tsar to stay in power although his decision-making when it came to World War I was so disastrous that it's hard to think United States or not, uh, Trotsky or not, Lenin or not, would still have been overthrown one way or another. Um, that, that's a speculation I would have to look into a lot deeper. But the ramifications of a completely uninvolved and neutral United States in World War I would have resulted in a different peace. Um, and again, the U.S. involvement and troops on the ground, even if they didn't fight for the first uh, almost a year, it was still a moral victory for the British and the French. And it was weighing on the mind of the Germans that they were there. Uh, knowing that you have a bigger enemy and it's a global war will always weigh on your mind. Um, but people were starving and soldiers were tired. So the war was coming to an end. The U U.S. intervention involvement or not, World War I would have come to an end. And probably, maybe, uh, have the, having the U.S. at the table <sighs> made the French and the British bolder. Because remember, the Treaty of Versailles was an extreme punishment of Germany and eventually with the treaty with Austria as well that was broken up and lost almost 50% of its territory. 
maybe the French and the British stood bolder in their demands uh, because they knew that they had U.S. on their side. And remember, the United States never ratified the Treaty of Versailles because even Wilson thought the demands were too extreme. He did a separate deal with a peace treaty with the Germans uh, later on. So there's pros and cons, especially after the war had ended and what kind of peace and future we'd be looking at. If the French and the British had been less aggressive in their demands at Treaty of Versailles with the Germans, uh, without a uh, American backing them, uh, possibly it would have been a more amenable peace with more benefits or so to the Germans, or at least less harsh terms, that would not have laid the foundation for World War II. It depends how things turned out. There's a lot of different ways this could have gone, but the only thing that's certain is the war would have ended, and Germany would not have won. Their defeat could have been a lesser defeat, um, and depending on what the Russians uh, could, what would they would have been doing if the Russian Revolution still had pulled Russia out of the war and Germany would still have defeated them and pulled all the way up to the line where they stood in 1918 Germany could theoretically have negotiated a peace in the West and still being in charge and held vast amount of territory to the East and there would have been no uh, future UN, uh, League of Nations, uh, after this, and possibly a more amenable Treaty of Versailles, leading not to World War II. So you never know. That's a lot of what-if that came up there. Um, well, I guess that, that boils down to how important was Trotsky for the Russian Revolution, um, if we kept him here. So there's a lot of what-ifs, but that is that is my take on that. Germany would have not won the war, uh, they would still have lost, but their defeat may have been more profitable to them or more amenable to them than uh, as it was with the United States backing French and uh, Britain. However, on to the next. All right, and the last question was interesting because I've seen different answers to this. And I, there are so many opinions on it. Who were the most unappreciated fighting units during World War II? Most unappreciated. I have seen people, historians, suggest it was the Russian infantry. I don't think they were unappreciated. Don't think the American uh, infantry was unappreciated. What about the Italian frogmen that lived on that sunken hull and... Uh, harassed British battleships. They were pretty top-notch. What about the uh, British frogmen? Of course, Britain won the war, so they were appreciated, but they're tough guys. What about the Chinese National Army that lost, what, six, eight times their number uh, fighting the Japanese? Uh, the Free Polish Army with their one submarine that was under siege and destroyed and impounded and ran and was attacked before it made contact with the British. There's a story right there. Um, when are we doing that movie, anybody in Hollywood? Um, what about the Eskimos in Alaska? They did a bit of fighting up there. The Gurkhas? I don't even know. The Danish bicycle troops at the border facing German tanks and armor? There's a lot of unappreciated fighting units. What about the Italian pilots of the Regina Aeronautica, the Royal Italian Air Force that fought alongside German uh, Air Force over Africa? And they had the, the Machi C202 Volcora, the Thunderbolt, which was every which way as good of a fighter plane as anything else in World War II. There was uh, some 166 Italian aviators that shot down over five planes, making them aces. Um, so, you know, the, the Italian Air Force, I think they should have a little bit of credit because we don't really give the Italian military fighting units a whole lot of credit. Um, 
but they had some good pilots and they did a good bit of a fighting and they got rewarded for it. What about the Japanese American army units that fought? I mean, they had a unit, go for broke was their unit motto. Uh, they had 21 medals of honor, 52 distinguished service crosses, 4,000 bronze stars, and 9,486 purple hearts. Have you ever even heard of the Japanese uh, American army units? Come on, they kicked some ass and they got duly recognized, but you haven't heard of them, so I certainly say they're underappreciated. So, who do I pick? There are so many to pick from, so I'm going to go with something you did not expect me to say. What about the French tankers during the Battle of France in 1940? Ah, didn't see that coming, did you? Because we all think that French was overrun in six weeks, and they all sucked, and they didn't put up a fight, and uh, all these things, the post-war impression uh, the during war impression of how easily it was uh, for the Germans to defeat France. And we see all these shot up French tanks littering everywhere thinking they had horrible tanks and uh, their soldiers must have fled and it's not entirely true. Um, the French soldiers, they fought hard. The problem the French had was they had a fairly good well worked out doctrine but so did the Germans. It was just two completely different doctrines that didn't really match each other. And the same thing had trickled down to a 1930s deterioration of the French professional army, uh, predominantly because leftist French politicians really didn't want a, a serious, well-trained, professional standing army because they might overthrow them. Uh, so they took away a lot of initiatives and they took a lot of initiative and they did not develop the tank arm and the tank doctrine as they should. They were merely relegated to infantry support and I don't think that's fair because in all honesty the French had some really good tanks. They were just dispersed and they were uh, deployed very poorly or again you look back to French leadership the French leadership that did not believe in telephones but dispatch writers um, sometimes the French communication back and forth it would take days before orders was reached uh, by the forward French units that at that time had been overrun by the way faster moving German units so French command can certainly be to blame and I'm gonna go over that in my episode on French and German doctrine but when you boil it down to the individual French tanks and tankers they were certainly unappreciated because the Sharp E1 tank the Germans had almost nothing except the 88s and airplanes that could shoot the thing up it was a match to any German tank um, even the Panzer IV with a short uh, 75 um, and the Panzer III with their little 37mm cannon. All the German uh, anti-tank guns, the 37mm, could not penetrate a uh, Sharpie, um, which is demonstrated very vividly. And let's talk about that, because if I ever want to bring up an example as to how uh, and why I believe that French tankers uh, were unappreciated, you take somebody like uh, Lieutenant Pilot, who in the Battle of uh, Somme, in his Char B1, shot up 11 uh, German tanks and several anti-tank guns, and he came out of that engagement with 140 hits to his Char B. Uh, the only time I remember hearing numbers like that was from the Tiger on the Eastern Front that had some 267 hits counted acid and damage to his running gear and his rolled back and that tiger had been hit by a lot larger calibers of course than the sharpie here had uh, what he did in the battle for son in france this town changed hands some 12 times there was vicious vicious fighting uh, at one point he rolled into the attack and saw rows of german tanks uh, panzer threes and panzer fours lined up in the street and having a turret 
and a hull gun, he shot up all of them as he rolled past them. Classic tank tactic. He shot up the rear tank first of the line, the column, and then the first, and then the roll down and shot them all up. They right boxed them in so they couldn't maneuver and rolled past those and came to another row of German tanks and shot them up and continued and shot up an anti-tank gun, turned a corner, shot up another one, and then he rolled back. And he did it all along because all the other tanks that were supposed to follow him uh, had broken down and got dispersed and one went missing. And uh, a Sharpie, one is a very large tank, so I don't know how, where it went missing to. I'm assuming they found it by now. Um, here's a brave tanker. He survived the war and ended up in French politics after the war. But here's a brave fighting tanker. And I think that's one of many examples of how French soldiers stood and held their ground uh, when they had the ability and the possibility to do so and took initiative uh, to stand up to, to German tanks and destroyed a lot of them. And I think that that's noteworthy. And when he comes back to back to the tank, there's a reason why the Germans repurposed a lot of these tanks and the turrets and some of their cannons. Um, but certainly, the French tankers uh, had an undeservedly uh, low reputation, and they did a they did a good job. And a lot of individual uh, heroics took place in the fighting, uh, but they were overrun by doctrine. The German fighting doctrine, uh, coordination between armor and air force, were just too much. But one on one, the, uh, the French tanks were absolutely a match to the German tanks. And we talk about the Maginot Line, uh, what a bad idea that was. But it wasn't, because it held and made the Germans attack somewhere else. And four of the six places where the German spearheads did attack the national line, they were held up for the first day. Um, so, yes, I'm saying unappreciated fighter units would be the French tankers. And I'm sure there's a lot more names that decides to go on that list except Pilot. Three questions Q&A. I'll keep it short today because, well, we all have stuff to do. And... Send me your questions, militaryhistoryqna at mail.com. Um, send me your suggestions as to Polish uh, military places, historical battlefields, bunkers uh, that I need to see while I'm out there. And I will see you all next week.